How did you first become interested in gerontology? Gerontology was a word that I heard in 1976 when I started graduate school at the University of Michigan. And at the time, I came in very interested in psychology and social work because those were the two fields I was studying. But I had worked a lot with children. So I heard the word gerontology. I said, that's an interesting concept, of course, the lifespan. And it goes all the way to older adulthood. So I started taking some courses uh, after uh, my first year. And I got hooked. And I started taking more courses and found opportunities to do research and some practice work with older adults. OK, so that kind of leads into my next question. Mm -hmm. So how did you trace your career in gerontology? Can you walk us through it? Absolutely. So I took courses. Uh, the University of Michigan, where I went to graduate school, had a certificate in gerontology. And although I did not get the certificate per se, I took a number of the courses. And I was, of course, studying uh, psychology and took life course development courses. And then in my second year, I did an internship at a family service agency that did a group for family caregivers. And that was really interesting to me. Then I wanted to get some experience working directly with older adults and did so through something like a volunteer program. I got paid minimum wage, but I did friendly visiting with an older man. And then over time, uh, in the later part of my graduate studies, I relocated to Durham, North Carolina, because at the time um, I was married to someone who was a graduate student there, and got involved with the Duke Aging Center. And that would be probably where I really got quite connected with the field of aging, because of all the incredible experts there. Mm -hmm. Got involved with the VA eventually ended up helping to get the GREC funded, the Geriatric Research Education Clinical Center at the VA in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, during that period of time, uh, one of the areas of research that I was involved in was on geriatric teamwork. And that was an area I, I did quite a bit of work in for a while and really loved working with veterans. I had some experience working with the VA before, but not in the aging field. And I was able to get a stipend through the VA to do my dissertation research, which didn't focus on older veterans per se, but because even at this time in the early 1980s, there were quite a few veterans who were in the older age group. I, I just continued my interest and, and focus throughout my VA career and my time at Duke, and then ended up relocating other places and always being very interested in aging and or healthcare because of my work within the VA system. Uh, in social work, I was often chairing a, a healthcare concentration and ultimately ended up uh, chairing an aging concentration uh, at the University of Maryland, which was my uh, position prior to uh, moving out to California. But uh, University of Maryland had a concentration in aging. And uh, I loved teaching the courses, a policy course and a human development course. And I've just been hooked. And I always have found ways to reinvent myself. I've been involved in rehabilitation, spirituality, substance abuse, creativity, and more recently, entrepreneurship and aging. Very interested in uh, how people 50 and older, including myself, can find ways through learning new uh, opportunities in the business world, making connections with people, taking ideas for developing new concepts and bringing new people together. So those are some of the areas that I've been involved in. My current position is with Fielding Graduate University. And I'm a professor in the School of Human and Organizational Development. And in that position, we have a doctoral concentration in creative longevity and wisdom. And that's a very exciting place to bring in doctoral students who want to study different aspects of not necessarily aging per se, but longevity, wisdom, creativity. And we have uh, fellows or scholars, I guess we call them, uh, uh, experts in the field of aging every year that we honor and, and give an award to. So I've been able to meet lots of the great giants in 
in aging, which include uh, one of my mentors, Rick Moody. Uh, the late Gene Cohen was one of our honorees, and I had a chance to get to know him a little bit um, while he was still living. And he influenced a lot of the work that I did in creativity. Okay, so was there a moment in your career where you decided that you identified as a gerontologist? That's a very interesting question because I believe there were probably flashes of experiences. For example, taking my first gerontology course, and it was a summer course where there was a lot of experiential activity. They had something called the aging game. I don't know if that's exactly what it was called, but it was comparable to something people have since done where we took a day and we did something that made us quote unquote older. I have a, a little bit of trouble with this idea right now just in terms of making it sound like, well, when you get old, you can't hear well or you can't see well. So what I did is I went without my glasses for a day because I'm very nearsighted. And it was really quote unquote eye-opening because just getting around and being nervous about falling, all of these types of things, it just made me think about what it would be like for people who have impairments that they, they can't correct. At least I could put my glasses back on and see 2020, but not everyone can. So once I took that course, and then the next year I was taking more courses, did the internship working with the families. Uh, the program was called As Parents Grow Older, and eventually they got some funding to develop a curriculum around this project. I had since left uh, Ann Arbor but I was excited to see these ideas growing. And, and then when I uh, moved to North Carolina, so I was finishing my doctoral studies, but got involved with the Duke Aging Center and then ultimately the VA when the GREC was funded. So I was able to work with clinicians at various different capacities, uh, physicians, nurses. I helped to train geriatric physicians, geriatric fellows. So it, it really established my sense of identity as an expert. So where that transition came from thinking I am a gerontologist to I am an expert in gerontology, I couldn't quite say. But I do know that joining the Gerontological Society of America as a student was very influential because then I got the journal and eventually started going to the conferences and meeting people who were doing this kind of research across different programs and universities was, was very, very powerful and, it, and it, it kept me in the field because as far as I'm concerned, one of the most important things about being in the field of aging is having opportunities to stay connected in the field, uh, learning new ways to work with older adults, finding new policy questions, or as I mentioned in, in an earlier question, reinventing oneself. So for me, staying in the field of aging has involved always finding new opportunities and new pathways, and, and it never ends. There's always something new and exciting. That's interesting. So it sounds like it's a little bit more of a process for you than it was a moment. Yes, I think, I think so. But I can say that when I heard the word gerontology, because uh, two of my classmates entering in the doctoral program in social work and social science came to Michigan to study aging and perhaps thinking that here's a place where I can learn something new and I suppose that's a theme for me in terms of my interest in aging. What's new? What's next? What's cutting edge? How can I be on that cutting edge and be a leading force? And gerontology because it's a relatively new field and especially in the 1970s it was um, not as widespread as it is now. I should also mention that uh, another very important influence, two, two things, and, and they paralleled each other. I got involved with an organization that I helped to rename as the Association for Gerontology Education and Social Work, and I was the president in the mid-1990s. And we didn't have a lot of people who were members then, but now it's our, our receptions, our overflow room of people coming but through being able to advocate for more programs and activities in gerontology, paralleling both with the Association for Gerontology Education and Social Work and then the John A. Hartford Foundation funding different initiatives in uh, geriatric social work, 
both of those activities really helped to propel the burgeoning of interest in gerontology and social work, and it was great to be part of many of those initiatives and, and a leader in those areas, too. Mm. So you already kind of answered a couple of your mentors in the field. Yes. I wanted to ask you specifically, were there any female mentors who had a specific impact on your career as a gerontologist? Yes. As a matter of fact, I did a poster session here about three of my mentors, and I did a survey asking other people who had been influenced by these mentors, mm -hmm. because there are so many important people. Um, and I will tell you who those three women are, and they're all gerontological social workers, but there was another person who was a woman who also influenced me, and I'll come back to, to her. Her name is Connie Goldman, and she's not a social worker, but she's a, a, a journalist and uh, a writer. But the three women gerontological social workers are the first person that I would say influenced me the most was Nancy Hoyman, and she's at the University of Washington. Uh, at the time I got to know her, she was the dean of the School of Social Work. And uh, she seemed to reach out to me, and I was very uh, impressed by her involvement, especially in social work. There was a strong women's advocacy uh, piece, and she's done so many different things in the field of social work, and I've always admired her, and she's just a wonderful and warm person, so I would say she was some someone who influenced me in her book that she co-authored on social gerontology. This is just excellent. Um, a second person, and this isn't necessarily an order of priority or even chronology, but uh, Rose Dobroff. Rose Dobroff is now a Maritime professor at uh, Hunter College in New York, and she was the head of the Brookdale Center on Aging, the found, one of the founding directors, and started the Journal of Gerontological Social Work. And although I never worked directly with her, I, I wasn't at Hunter, but um, she helped me make some contacts with people when I was moving to that area. I lived in, in Connecticut for a while, and so she helped me connect with some people for job possibilities, and later on, we were in a session together, and it was right before the 1995 White House Conference on Aging, and I said, wouldn't this make a great special issue? And she said, well, let's do it. So we took a session we had done that she was also involved in, and the people who were presenters wrote up their presentations as papers, and I edited the special issue. So I think that that was another way that Rose, and this was mid-career for me, made me realize how important it is to get the visibility, and so it was really the social work response to the White House Conference on Aging. That was the, the, the subtitle of the book. It was both a book and special issue of, journal, of gerontological social work, and I still stay in touch with Rose. She's just a very, very dynamic and special and influential person. And the third person I wanted to cite is Barbara Berkman. And Barbara, like Nancy Hoyman, Barbara Berkman had a very influential role in helping to develop a cadre of gerontological or geriatric social work educators, in particular through the John A. Hartford Foundation. And Barbara was one of the people who was a reviewer, I found out later, for my promotion to, uh, I guess it was promotion and tenure when I was at the University of Maryland. And so she was following my, my work. I, well, she was an external reviewer. So when, when people are promoted, you give them names of people you want to write letters on your behalf, and then they pick other people. And it turns out she was one of the people who had been following my work. So I have a lot of uh, uh, respect and admiration for her for, again, helping to show the value of the kind of work that I was doing in the field of aging because in many institutions and organizations, uh, especially in higher education, uh, I don't believe that the value of studying aging is always recognized because fewer students go into aging and social work than into other areas, in particular, many people go into social work to work with children, as was true for me. So I think it was very important for me uh, to know that Barbara was supporting my career in that way. 
and also I was involved with the Faculty Scholars Program as a mentor, so she helped me uh, further my mentoring role as well. Another person I want to mention, Connie Goldman, she's a journalist. She had a show back in the 1980s on National Public Radio as the arts correspondent, and her show highlighted older adults, and at that time very few people were doing any kind of reporting. And subsequent to getting to know her, because I was very interested in the show she's, shows she was producing and the writing she was doing, I got to know her personally, and we've been friends ever since the mid-1990s. And I also am a journalist. I do a radio show called Experience Talks in Los Angeles on KPFK FM. And the theme is really about people with experience. They don't have to be older adults, but we, we have a lot of older people mostly authors and sometimes artists and musicians who are very uh, important people that we want to highlight their contributions. So I do interviews with uh, people who have experience on Experience Talk. So Connie Goldman was very influential in helping me to see the value of bringing these voices into the media. Okay. Is there anything based on your own career Mm -hmm. and these mentors that you've had that mm -hmm. you see as being special about being a woman gerontologist? What is special about being a woman gerontologist? Special or unique? Okay. Well, I would say special would be because older women are the majority of older adults, because women, at least historically, and I assume that will continue to be the case through my life span, are uh, more likely to live longer than men. So I think it's very important for women to show how resilience is very important. That reminds me of another mentor I'll come back to about resilience. Uh, so being a woman, I feel it's very important to be a role model for other women not just professionally, but also in terms of self-care, living a healthy lifestyle, which isn't so easy at conferences, but we try. Uh, so as a woman, I feel that I can bring forth ideas about wellness, self-care, caring for other people. Uh, I like to think that younger women will think about what their older years will be like and think about somebody like me. And I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of person, I like to do a lot of things that aren't necessarily what you would consider someone my age, because I'm 60 years old, but I do a lot of yoga and I go to festivals and I, uh, people enjoy hearing about all my adventures. I'm, I'm quite active. And so to me, that's important. And it's not that to be older, you have to stay quote unquote busy. It's not so much about being busy, but it's about staying involved and engaged in things that, that really bring life and vitality. So I feel that that's one thing that's important to me about being a woman who's a gerontologist going into my later years. I love that you're highlighting the different cohorts, kind of, of mm -hmm. women gerontologists and how we all inform each other. Yes. And your role is both a mentee and a mentor. Absolutely. It's really important because without the mentors, I wouldn't be where I am. And for me, being a mentor is quite important. In fact, I, I was inspired to do my presentation here at GSA because one of the people I saw last year at GSA came up to me and said, you're my, you're my grand mentor. And I looked at her, I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, you're the mentor of my mentor. And I'm like, well, this is an interesting concept. And then when I saw her this year, she said, well, now you're a great grand mentor, and now I'm mentoring people. So mm -hmm. I love the idea that, that the, the role of mentoring, it, 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 it perpetuates. And I think mm -hmm. the important thing is then that helps me to feel like whatever contributions I've made mentoring people, that, that influences how they will then continue to mentor other people, especially in the field of aging, to keep people interested and excited in this important work. Mm -hmm. Kind of a pay it forward effect. 
Exactly, exactly. Do you have one other mentor related to resilience that you want to talk Yes, to? I wanted to talk about Roberta Green, and Roberta Green also is a, a, a gerontological social worker. She is now retired and an emeriti professor from the university, most recently University of Texas in Austin, mm -hmm. and I've known Roberta for a number of years, but the last project she did when she was at the University of Texas in Austin was a study of Holocaust survivors. And she recruited me to help find Holocaust survivors in Los Angeles, and I coordinated interviews. And I felt that Roberta's work, the idea was to look at survivorship and also resilience. And it brought me into that whole area of resilience and, and positive psychology, which I was interested in anyway. But I really love the concept of resilience, and I think she herself has both embodied that in the work and the legacy that she has in her life um, offered to people like myself. But also, I got to know one of the Holocaust survivors who's still uh, a good friend of mine, and she's 93 years old. Her name is Erica Leon, and in many ways, she's a mentor for me as well. She's not a professional, but she knows how to grow old, and she lived through the Holocaust in Hungary by surviving in hiding and finding different ways, making critical decisions where her life was saved instead of destroyed. And so, again, this concept of resilience, I think, is very important in aging. And to have people who are studying resilience or embody resilience to show that even with many impairments, as my friend Erica Leon does, that you can still live a life with meaning and quality. Mm -hmm. So your mentors have done a lot of different things. Yes. Right? They've inspired your own work. They've yes. connected you to other people. Uh, they've been warm and welcoming to you into the field. Is there any other way that they, you think that they've impacted your career? Well, um, I'm remembering now one of my answers to a question about early influences in terms of older adults. And I kept going back and back thinking, well, obviously I must have had some interest in older people before hearing the word gerontology. I didn't think that in itself. So I started thinking about when I was growing up in St. Louis, that's where I was born and raised, before I went off to graduate school in Michigan. And in my early years, I lived in a home, a two-family home. Uh, my uh, mother's oldest sister and her family lived upstairs, and we lived on the first floor. And on either side, we had neighbors, in one case, an older couple, and I don't know how old they were. They seemed really old when I was very young. And then on the other side, there was a, a, a woman and her husband. They never had children, but her aunt lived with them, and, and she was quite old. She was probably in her 80s or 90s. So this is in the 1950s and 60s. And one of the things that I thought about in terms of who influenced me in terms of caring for older people and valuing older people, and I would have to say it was my mother. And my mother, who's still living and about to turn 90 in a couple of months, I think had always encouraged us to be respectful of older people. And her father lived to be 94, and she and her sister, she was the youngest of six, and they took turns taking care of him. So he, he died in, in, a, in, in, in the home where he was living with one of his, his daughters, not, not with our family. But seeing my mother help out with his care, and also my father's mother lived to be in her 80s and was in a retirement community in her later years. And my mother would go and visit, even though my father was not that close to his family for a lot of reasons. And yet, my mother, I think, felt the sense of obligation to, to older people would be my guess. And somehow, I think I embraced that. So I would have to say that my mother was also, her name is Dolores Corley. She lives in St. Louis. And um, oftentimes, we forget that there are these early influences that make us interested in something about aging. And sometimes it's negative things. I will have to say there's one other story I want to tell, and it's, it's not a very fun story, but a full confession. When I was 13, I believe it was, there was an organization tied in with the church that I went to at the time, 
where young women, I think it was all women, would uh, do some volunteer work, and I don't remember what else was part of that, but I was assigned to go to a nursing home, and I went to this nursing home. This was in maybe 1967. I walked in there, it smelled horrible, and I got scared, and I said, I can't do this, so I dropped out of the society, and so sometimes I think to myself, maybe I felt so guilty all these years that I felt like I have to pay back my, my inability to tolerate that scene at that time, but I think, I think I probably just didn't get a very good introduction to it, and it was, it was scary, and um, maybe that influenced me in some way to think about, well, how can we give a more, more inviting experience? And it's not to say always more positive, because sometimes working with any age group that has um, challenges and vulnerabilities, but I've always tried to encourage students that I've worked with to spend some time with older people and not necessarily just for a, a, a paper or an assignment, but for example, my friend Erica Leon, many, many students have gotten to, to meet her and visit with her and hear about her story. I do think it's important for people to know the life stories, to not just see someone who's a certain age without understanding how they got to be where they are. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it was a personal process for you throughout your career. Yes. Getting to know the field of aging as well. So right. Uh, being a gerontologist interacted with your own aging process, and how do you think it has? Well, one of the things that I discovered as I moved into my mid midlife years is because I knew so much about what, quote unquote, the normal aging process and also things that can happen that are perhaps preventable in some cases. So I became much more aware about things like how the skin ages and diet and also staying mentally active and socially engaged, all of these things that different researchers have studied. So not only have those influenced myself and my own behaviors as I've gotten older, but also I, I, I believe compared to many people who are my peers, I'm already thinking about where do I wanna live when I'm 70 if I'm not living with a, a partner or I, I doubt that I'll be living with my daughters. I don't think that that's what they have in mind when their mother gets older, but I, for example, I. Uh, did a, a study, I was part of a study on long-term care insurance in the 19, late 1980s when it was first coming out. So I have purchased long-term care insurance before I turned 50 so that the rates would be low and if I needed any kind of long-term care, which can happen at, at any age, that I'd already have some resources for that. So I think being in the field has helped me to think ahead and think not only about health, but finances, living arrangements, who the kinds of people I want in my life, and my spiritual life. My spiritual path has definitely grown and evolved as I think about the meaning of life and grief and loss as I've lost my father uh, within the last year and think about what's happening with my mother as she enters her 90s very soon. Uh, I think all of these things have made me very introspective about my own aging process. And, and those are things that I hope to write about at some point, when I'm not doing all the other things I'm doing. <laughs> so you talked about being able to plan for resources mm -hmm. for when you're aging, mm -hmm. but also the spiritual side. Yes. And then you briefly said something about the social relationships yes. as well and what you value in those right. things, it sounds like. Yes. Could you say a little bit more about that? Well, for me, especially seeing older people who either have lived alone because they're widowed or um, they're empty nesters and then they age in place with no one at home with them, I think that one of the things that seems to me most important in what I've learned in my own research and studies that I've been following is that staying socially connected is very important for people. Uh, some people enjoy living alone, 
I probably won't be one of those people. I still have a daughter at home. And um, I enjoy my time alone, don't get me wrong. I enjoy my freedom and being able to go places, uh, make decisions without having to consult a lot of people. But I do believe that we are social creatures by nature. And even for people who spend a lot of time alone or envision being, you know, having their own place or an apartment or whatever, I know for myself, because it's so important for me to stay connected with people, and I'm talking about people across my career, so that's why staying connected to my mentors and mentees has been very important. But I also believe that especially uh, when people reach a point where they're less mobile, and my friend Erica Leon, who's 93, she, she's had a lot of mobility problems now, and even though she's in a retirement community, even to just be in her room, for hours at a time, having trouble getting out and going places, even within the facility. I know how much she values people calling her, emailing her, she's very big on email, she Skypes. And so I think ahead about that for myself, like what kind of community would I wanna live in? Probably not a traditional retirement community. Um, I just came from uh, there was a session on the village concept, so I'm starting to think about some of these things. So over the next decade or so, if I'm not living in a single family home anymore, which I don't expect I will indefinitely, what kind of community do I want? Not necessarily community even where I live, but who are the kinds of people I want to stay connected with? Um, if I become less mobile, how can I stay more engaged with people to compensate? First of all, I want to say I am really excited about this project. I'm glad to see that the legacies of women, and this is a field where the majority of people who grow older are women, and yet at the same time, being in the field as long as I have been, um, I see that women have made increasingly more contributions and play a larger role, especially in the academic world at being leaders in thinking about issues that are important, being involved with a variety of organizations, especially across disciplines, which I think is, is quite important. And one concern that I have, and it came up from my presentation on mentoring, is that people, if they're no longer coming to conferences or in their primary professional roles, and they may be retired or emeriti professors or wh whatever they're doing, it's very easy for people to forget what they've done and what they've contributed, especially for people coming into the field who never met these people. Maybe they've heard their names. And so I think it's extremely important that across the field of aging that people who have come before us, so to speak, even people whose work maybe isn't as cited as often as it might have been back in the beginning days of the field of gerontology, but there are some incredible leaders and thought leaders, some of them are thought leaders, some of them have been involved in policies, and maybe even people who weren't in the gerontology field but have done a lot legislatively. I'm thinking of people like Barbara Mikulski who's a senator from the state of Maryland, let's keep their legacy going and help people to understand how we built upon each other's work and contributions. So I think this is a great project, and I hope that this will spawn more of this kind of work, both in terms of hearing the stories, because I think the stories are what draw people into their, the interest. And I would love to see more stories of people who are now unable to travel or be part of special programs and so on. And even people who we may not think have done anything in particular special or um, have any kind of particular distinction, but have lived very you know, interesting and uh, inspirational lives. So hopefully there will be other women, 
even outside the field of our, our, our gerontology specialty, but who have helped other people, and especially helping women. Mm -hmm. Younger women, I think, need really good role models. And they don't have to be other women, but uh, I think it's important for people to recognize that women are strong and powerful and that women can make changes. And sometimes the changes you don't always see at the beginning, but, but because women also tend to do things together and support each other, I think it's important for people to know that and see the impact over time.